Okay, um, so I'm just going to start talking about better populations. We're going to run out of time, to, so we'll continue this on. But um, so another tool that we have to think about understanding organisms out in the, our landscapes is this idea of metapopulations. Okay. So um, what is a metapopulation? A metapopulation is a population of populations. Now that might sound like, if you recall from intro bio, our organizations, genes, cells, tissues, organs, individuals, populations, species, or actually, sorry, species, sorry, uh, species, then populations, then communities, right, et cetera. So you might think that this is a community, right, but, or, or a species, but um, in, in reality, this, a metapopulation is a spatially structured um, uh, thing below the level of the species. So this is not a species level thing yet. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a population of populations. It's a group of populations. First uh, classically formulated um, uh, by uh, a mathematical ecologist from back east, Levins, um, that uh, uh, put the first initial thinking together on this in the 60s. It really gets going in the 80s. Um, but, but nevertheless, this is a, a key way of how many conservation folks think about many of their organisms. And we will have a guest speaker particularly talk about one great case study, uh, or what, what, we're gonna get an example of this um, uh, later in the semester on tidewater gobies and how they um, behave like a metapopulation. But uh, for now, these are, let's think about them as, as different disjunct chunks of a critter. So a population in this one little patch or one little area separated from another patch, another, another a bunch of individuals in this other area, etc. They are connected in some way, shape, or form, but they're not connected all the time. They're connected by dispersal, by movement in between these patches. The metapopulation which again has all these patches, those patches can wink on and off. So there could be individuals in that space in any one given day, or they could have disappeared. And so for example, here's an, exa here's a, a, an example of some of these bighorn sheep, and you can see their distribution. So these guys, if you recall, or maybe you don't recall, but, but, but so you guys know, these individuals live on in, you know, alpine, steep environments, mountaintops, those types of settings. They don't live in the bottom of valley floors and things of that nature. So they've evolved to deal with really sheer cliffs, hard to walk on craggy, uh, you know, steep rocky hillsides, that kind of stuff. And so their distribution um, uh, in the lower right looks kind of funky, right? So we have these individuals and they're there and they're isolated in these little patches. It's possible for them to disperse in between one peak and another but they don't routinely move between those peaks. So here's some rabbits. The old rabbits, the old good, our old, our old friend the rabbits. And so um, the classic way of thinking about a population would be this, this upper graph up here, right? Which is that um, uh, we have a single group of individuals in a single patch. And what's going to go on them is they're going to have some babies, they're going to have some death, um, that kind of stuff, right? And, th and that's, what's going to, that's what's going to control how many there are in, in our, um, let's say, in our front yard or something like that. A metapopulation is, is thinking, let's not think about our front yard. Let's think about our front yard and our neighbor's front yard and our neighbor's neighbor's front yard and our neighbor's 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 front yard, that kind of stuff. So it's a collection of these populations. And maybe... There's no, there are no rabbits on my lawn this year, or, or, or you know, few rabbits on my lawn this year. But some of them can disperse across the street sometimes into my lawn and then colonize my lawn. And so we call that patch dynamics. We call that moving from one to another and the winking on of some patches and the winking on of some patches patch dynamics.
So this is the idea of a meta population. Key aspects about this is, are that meta populations exist naturally. I just showed you those, those big giant sheep, right? We didn't, we didn't make mountaintops. They just, that's how they were. So, we, so meta populations can exist naturally or meta populations can be creative because of what we're doing to uh, the ecosystem. As we talked about before, when we talked about variability, spatial variation, there's always some uh, difference in quality, right? There's always some optimal place, there's always some suboptimal place. And essentially what we're talking about here is sort of the extremes of that. So a patch is a place where um, critters can meet their, their, um, their living needs. There's water, there's, there's prey, there's... Um, you know, refuge from predators and those kinds of things, right? So they could, they could be totally happy, theoretically, just, just in their little patch. So that is a, a patch is a good habitat for a given organism. The patches are separated by what we call matrix. So matrix is, is not Keanu Reeves, whoa. Uh, but the matrix is the gunk in between. In some cases, the matrix can be massively hostile to the organism. In other cases, it can be, eh, it's not so much hostile, but they just, but they can't make their living there. They, they couldn't settle down and, and, and have offspring and do all that kind of stuff there. So a classic example would be here, like the Hawaiian Islands. So if we were some birds, some songbirds in the Hawaiian Islands, we, um, and we lived on you know, trees or whatever, obviously the, uh, the, you know, Oahu has trees, Maui has trees, the big island has trees, but they're separated by water. So my bird can fly across, it's maybe a little hard, it's not close by, I have to fl fly for a long time, but theoretically I can, I can move through the matrix and get to my patch. That would be an example of a naturally occurring patch and matrix. Um, other cases would be something like maybe these quail, right? So these quail are in these uh, vegetated forested patches, right? That used to be contiguous, but now we've come in and fragmented them, let's say with agricultural land or whatever. Now, obviously these birds can move from one patch to another, but it's a lot harder, okay? They're more vulnerable. If you guys have ever seen a, a, you know, a quail, they can fly, but they don't fly very long, right? They're kind of like, and they, they kind of fly glide, you know, so they don't, they don't fly for hours and hours. So they mostly walk on the ground. So that means when they're walking from, from, I don't know, patch one right here to patch two right here, that means they could be vulnerable to fox, to cats, to other predators, right? To hawks that can see them because they're not undercover. So they're not going to die instantly, but it's not an easy place to make a living. They're not going to be setting up shop and just chilling all day long in that agricultural field. If they do, they'll be dead pretty quickly. Does that make sense? So patch matrix uh, are the key, um, are, the, are the minimum type of, of, of space, spaces we talk about when we talk about metapopulation dynamics. Okay, other key aspect of patches are that um, uh, the patches can go extinct. So our, our critters in that patch can disappear, but the population can persist. So even if a fire comes through, let's say, and burns that patch, or if a predator somehow discovered that patch and ate all the individuals in there, even if, even if our individuals go extinct in that patch, the overall meta population can still be stable, can still persist. And a key idea here is that once that patch goes empty, it can be re-inoculated. It can be recolonized. Maybe not the very next minute, but at some point in the future, it can be repopulated. So the key idea here, patches can go extinct and patches can be recolonized. And so, for example, um, we see that in places like our, along our coast, where we have estuaries that are that are necklaced here and there. They're not consistent estuaries everywhere. It's not like the Gulf Coast. It's not like the East Coast. We have this little teeny patch of salt marsh 
and then it's miles maybe in miles of nothing and uh, of, of no salt marsh I should say and then a little teeny small salt marsh and then maybe miles and miles of nothing and then a little teeny tiny salt marsh something like that right so so uh, so in this I in this sort of setting rocky intertidal uh, 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 salt marsh we could imagine organisms that live in there and that get dispersed out into the ocean, which is a, is a harsh place for critters that like to live in this, you know, nice, pretty plant-filled estuary. So they mostly probably die when they get washed out, but they could theoretically be washed out and, and get to another one, right? So that, that, that's a, a classic example of metapopulations. And we see this all over the place with all kinds of individuals. That movement to go from patch one to patch two can happen at various life history stages. It can happen before fertilization, so it could be sperm and eggs. Pollen is a classic example. It could be post-fertilization, so it can be a little seed or a larvae floating in the water or a seed dispersing in the air. So it's not yet a, an adult, it's not yet a fully formed, orga, uh, fully formed you know, multicellular organism but it's got all the ability to do that, or all, all the genetic tools to do that. Or it could happen, the dispersal and connectivity could happen from adults, either by choice, say I can't find a mate, so I'm gonna start dispersing wide, far and wide to find a mate, or there could be an environmental thing like a flood that would blow me out of the estuary and blow me out into the ocean, then I swim back looking for an estuary and find a new one. Um, so those, those are the three main ways that we can get patch colonization. Pre-fertilization, post-fertilization, both single cell or very small organisms, and then adults um, where they're full grown and they're, they're choosing or they're, they're incidentally moving around. Um, It doesn't matter what happens with any one individual patch. What matters is the overall patch situation. And so we get persistence um, uh, if the extinctions are less than or, or equal to the colonizations. If the extinctions exceed the colonization, then, that, then the metapopulation is gonna go extinct. Um, yeah, I'll leave the rest for uh, the next time we go into this in more depth. Okay, so this is the original formulation of the model. This looks kind of complicated, but it's pretty simple. So P is the proportion of patches occupied at any one time. Okay, and, and it's pretty much not gonna be 100%. So it's gonna be something less than 100% in the real world. So the proportion of patches occupied. T is the time step, typically, we think about this as on a yearly basis, but it doesn't have to be, but simplest thing is think of year one, year two, year three, like that. Colonization rate is uh, how quickly an empty patch gets filled on average. Extinction rate or extinction capacity is the probability of any one patch going extinct in any one year. Okay, so we have Proportion of the patches occupied, some time factor, and then colonization rate and extinction rate. And so this is just, so how we get this, how this formula is derived, the simplest, the simplest initial Levin's model is the change of the proportion occupied for each time step, the change in time. So that's dp dt differential. And you, you can get that by taking the colonization rate times the proportion, uh, my, one minus the well, total proportion uh, times that, uh, minus the extinction rate times the proportion. You can think of this as the colonization rate. This part of the equation right here is the colonization rate minus the extinction rate. And that's going to give us the, the change. 
So if p equaled 1, which it pretty much never is in the real world, but if it equaled 1, then every single site would have you know, at least one individual, right? So every site would, would have a, a, an organism living in it. If p was 0, the metapopulation would be extinct. No individuals would be alive in, in this area. Um, right. OK, cool. Make sense? OK. So this is useful to us in a conservation biology context because many organisms have a patchy habitat. Rarely do we have a homogeneous, everything's the same everywhere. Right? We, we have higher quality, lower quality. We have areas that are, that are just physically separated from another area. Um, and it turns out this has, be, this has become a really useful tool for, for modeling how we might get things to, to persist over time. Um, fragmentation makes things more like a patch matrix environment. Um, edge effects and encroachment of invasive species and things of that, make, uh, that nature um, tend to make smaller and smaller patches. Maybe we start off with a large patch and the patch gets smaller because stuff creeps in from the edges and effectively makes the, the core patch even smaller. And when that happens, we tend to see lower colonization rate and higher extinction rates. And it's also useful because we can't save every patch everywhere all the time but it helps us sort of say, hey, we need a minimum number of these patches out here to have this population persist, right? To have the species persist in our area. So the idea of metapopulation thinking is helpful in terms of planning, in terms of policy, in terms of strategizing what we're gonna do when we don't have unlimited funds to save everything everywhere 100% of the time, all the time. And so I'll just talk about one example and then we'll probably pause here. Um, uh, so uh, there are many classic examples of metapopulations, but um, one, I'll skip the mountain lions for now. I'll skip those. Okay, so, um, so uh, one would be butterflies, but I first want to say that we've already seen an example of a metapopulation so far. There's various flavors, just like we had various flavors of island biogeography theory, there's various flavors of metapopulation theory, and it's gotten more sophisticated over the years. But um, the classic example would be an, a mainland island relationship, or you could also call that a core population and, a satell and satellite populations. It's the same, same idea. And so we've seen this in the Simberloff and Wilson um, study, right? So we have Florida, mainland Florida, where the insects are chilling out on the, in the mangroves in large swaths and up and down the Florida Keys. And then they went and they were manipulating little teeny tiny micro islands, little patches, right? And for these terrestrial insects, the water is the matrix. And when the thing is big enough, when the core or the mainland is the big enough, we consider that stable. That's not going to go extinct, right? So that, that, that's a perpetual source, if you will. And it's resistant to extinction in this initial formulation. And in, in, the, in the theory of island biogeography, it's resistant to, to going extinct. But those small subsets that they tarped, that they fumigated, those things could go extinct, right? Those, those, there's no guarantee that the, that, the, um, or that the population of insect species X is going to stay on uh, you know, mangrove island Y. Um, so let's talk real quickly about, and we'll just have one example, and then we'll pause this. We'll come back to this later. But um, the bay checker spot butterfly, which is one of the species I uh, used to work on when I was up, uh, up in Stanford. And so this is a, a classic metapopulation. So this is what these guys look like, very pretty little butterfly. They're, they exist in our California grasslands. Um, 
and these are two hanging out in the um, spring sun. So these individuals, um, these butterflies, are the, th this stage of the butterfly are only around for a few weeks. So they spend most of their lives not like this. Most of their lives, they're in a larval stage. So these individuals, when they're in this stage, they're flying around, finding a mate, mating, laying eggs. And then they die pretty quickly. So these individuals are really dictated by where their host plants are, particularly where the plants are that they can, that they can lay their eggs upon, that the eggs can then develop upon. And so uh, because they're an instect, they go through several, we call instar, <coughs> several larval stages. And in some cases, not, not, not this one, but, but, but some of our butterflies, each, each instar has a different plant requirement. In this case, um, uh, these guys all, uh, prefer um, this clover, this owl clover. But regardless, um, they, need, they need some plants. So it's not just the butterflies. They, need, they have this very specific requirement for what makes something a patch, what makes something good habitat for them. Historically, meaning before uh, the gold rush happened, these butterfly were all throughout the San Francisco Bay Area, all over the place. East Bay, North Bay, South Bay, uh, peninsula, everywhere. Um, on the order of uh, pretty, we think, pretty ubiquitous over about 400 square kilometers. Then uh, we started fragmenting the habitat, but also, importantly for these guys, we also introduced a lot of invasive species. So a lot of these, the, all the stuff that you guys saw when we did our, our surveys up, at, um, up in the grasslands uh, the last couple weeks. Right, so all these Eurasian grasses, all these non-native forbs came in, and they basically outcompeted and smothered the plants that the butterfly needs to complete their life cycle. So the butterfly started winking off and disappearing across large sections. The one place they persisted is this type of native grass that's hard for the invasives to invade, called serpentine grassland. So serpentine, the native um, species, the native plants have persisted and they're, they're still there. They're invasive there too, but they, the natives have hung on fairly well in these serpentine soils. Now the serpentine soils are not everywhere. They're, they're restricted. There's only, there's only few patches here and there. And so my lab has been studying this. This is, this is an old slide. My lab has been studying these for like 50 years now. Um, and uh, this is one of the first places that we showed populations can go extinct in a metapopulation context. The overall species in the area still is around, but in a specific little area, even though it could only be a five minute walk from another patch, we're not talking about going to the East Coast. So it could be very, very close, totally within the, the butterfly flying distance of another patch, but a population can go extinct uh, in, that, in that area. And that, that, has, that has happened. And this really helped uh, provide a lot of um, uh, empirical support for the idea of metapopulations, in the, especially in the 80s. And armed with this data, the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service would go on to list checker spot butterflies as an endangered species in 1987 based on, on some of these findings. And as of now, only a, I, th I think this is correct. I haven't checked in the last uh, since COVID and stuff, but I think we only have five populations remaining uh, in in this in this part of the San Francisco Bay Area. So that means that for this meta population, there's a total of five patches. There aren't hundreds and hundreds of patches. And so this is what it looks like. So this is uh, grassland. So the areas that I've shown you are, and this data is old but um, uh, this is from 87, but you get the idea. So this is, the black is suburbia. The black are people's houses, the black are streets, businesses, that kind of stuff. So what used to be contiguous grassland is now fragmented into patches, and the dynamics are, um, are uh, behave like a metapopulation. So this Morgan Hill patch, which is quite large, right? has thousands of butterflies, or wait, I should say 1987 has had thousands of butterflies. Then we have some of these, and that's the dark pink. 
Then we have this sort of rose pink, lighter pink, and this area had nine patches that had on the order of tens to hundreds of butterflies. Not a lot, but they, but they, they were there. And so we would say this uh, big uh, dark red would be um, occupied. This pink would be occupied. But then all these other patches, even though they could be quite close, right, just a kilometer or two away, um, they're not being colonized, right? They are being, they, they, are, they are potentially, if we could pick up some butterflies and maybe physically carry them over and we humans inoculate the area, they could maybe establish and be there because their host plants are there, but they haven't made it there. And so uh, this is a classic example of a metapopulation structure. And so this is what, this is um, one example of what's going on, right? So, so uh, in, in a cartoon fashion with metapopulations, we would say a filled in patch is, it means there's at least one individual there, right? And so this is the, this is the example of um, island biogeography theory, right? We have the mainland, then we have the islands, or the so-called um, uh, 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 core population is in the middle. And so over time, this would be what would be happening, right? So things are winking on and off. So uh, by definition, the core, the mainland, doesn't go extinct, but the satellite populations might go extinct, might not go extinct, might get recolonized, might not get recolonized, whatever, but overall it's stable. Um, and I'll just say, we have other types of dynamics that we'll talk about later, but I want to pause now. And so this would be a more um, common, well, I wouldn't say more common. This, this is another also <laughs> fairly common example where we don't have necessarily a mainland or a core, but everything is sort of equal, equal sized, right? And so we have some things where critters go to, is this not animated? I guess this is animated the same way. Okay, so, so we have some things where um, because of the ecology of the situation, it might look like it is a good place. Let's look at this guy right here. It might look like it's a good place, and indeed my individuals can disperse in there and start living, but maybe that's a place that is where the wildfires always hit, or where the hurricanes often strike, or where the predator comes around fairly frequently, right? And so even though I might be in this place, over time, I rarely get guys coming out of there. So they go there and they never come from there. You can also get that if maybe this is the mainland and the winds are blowing this way, right? So the winds are blowing offshore. So my seeds in the springtime only ever blow away from this area, right? So that would be a so-called sink. That would be a place that receives individuals, but doesn't either because of ecological or, or, or atmospheric or, or abiotic reasons can't uh, get. You can also think of it as the bottom of a hill. And if it's a seed, and maybe it's a pine cone. So maybe the pine cone can roll down the hill, but it's almost impossible for that pine cone to go up the top of the mountain, right? So we can get this idea of a sink population and we can get this idea of a source population, one that's constantly put, pumping out babies, constantly pumping out individuals that can go to other sites, right? And so source sinks are also um, a, a fairly common thing. And so having a sink isn't bad, having a source isn't bad, but if all we have are sources or sinks and our source gets compromised, then we're, then we're in trouble, right? So uh, I'll just pause that there and say that metapopulations get more complex, but you guys get the idea, right? Patch matrix, Things can disperse across the matrix, but, it's, but they can't live in the matrix. And in some cases, the matrix is really hard to move through. In other cases, it's just kind of hard to move through. And all this together can help us understand what leads to the persistence of a species in an area, what leads to the persistence of the overall so-called meta-population, the population of populations. Does that make sense? Questions about that first introduction to meta-populations? 